Higgitus figgitus! Welcome art music history fans to our latest installment of art music for the holidays. In this survey, I, your host Tristan Andrew, will show you some famous examples of compositions depicting magic and how they relate to Halloween. So prepare for some hocus pocus as we begin our magical journey. Sit back, buckle up, and let me explain. <laughs> What is magic, anyway? Well, technically, magic is the application of beliefs, rituals, or actions employed in the idea that they can manipulate natural or supernatural beings and forces. It is a category into which have been placed various beliefs and practices sometimes considered separate from both religion and science. Or, you know, people flying without aircraft, producing strange effects without obvious technology, mind reading or predicting future events, aka divination, talking with or somehow animating the dead, and so on. Connotations have varied from positive to negative at times throughout history. Within Western culture, magic has been linked to ideas of the other, foreignness, and primitivism, indicating that it is a powerful marker of cultural difference and likewise a non-modern phenomenon. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Western intellectuals perceived the practice of magic to be a sign of primitive mentality and also commonly attributed it to marginalized groups of people. Prior to our modern time, Magic and those who practiced it were feared and assumed to be evil. Some cultures took a more neutral view. Magic was merely power of a sort, while the intent regarding its use was the real sign of good or evil. When we think of a holiday for celebrating magic, we think of... Halloween! <laughs> it comes from ancient Celtic beliefs regarding a period in which the boundary between the human and supernatural worlds is thinnest, Samhain, when spirits and supernatural creatures would cross over into our own world. For Christians, transforming this holiday into something acceptable involved creating a celebration of saints or hallowed souls, and that spooky liminal time became known as All Hallows' Eve and ultimately Halloween. Halloween was associated with those demonic witches so one would get into church and pray to the saints. We had literally centuries of witchcraft hysteria and violence against suspected practitioners. From the witch craze in Europe, which saw an estimated 50,000 people burned and hanged, to the notorious Salem witch trials in New England, it was only with the Enlightenment that scientific thinking began to banish such fears. In our own time, magic and Halloween have become more a form of entertainment than terror. 
And as with all forms of art, music reflects the changing culture and its ideas. So, since the Enlightenment, we have had composers creating art music that evokes magic in all its forms, from the scary to the scintillating, from the frightening to the fun. Let's take a look, shall we? <laughs> the age of invention coincided with the Enlightenment, but fear of magic still dominated the arts. One of the best examples of how art music dealt with magic and witchcraft in the age of invention is Henry Purcell's Dido and Aeneas of 1689, based on Virgil's epic of a Trojan survivor's journey to found the city of Rome. In the Aeneid, Aeneas is confounded and guided by the Roman gods, but in Purcell's opera, the Roman pantheon is represented by demonic witches the only acceptable means of introducing non-Christian supernatural elements at that time. The music is, of course, wonderful, but there is no sense of play or titillation in the role of the witches. We must wait for the age of elegance to find composers willing to approach magic with humor and a sense of adventure. I am talking about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and his spectacular final opera, The Magic Flute. Mozart's great humanity opens the door to greater expression. Born in Salzburg in 1756 and dying in Vienna 1791, Mozart, unlike any other composer in musical history, wrote in all the musical genres of his day and excelled in them all. Some say that his music lacks social relevance, but it nonetheless touches us. His dignified compassion in the face of life's challenges makes his music compelling, even when it is tranquil. His genius is uncluttered, without cynicism or intellectual pretension. It is in Mozart's music that we begin to see a greater expression of the darkness of the heart rather than of the times. It is this that has called some to call him the first great romantic. It is also in this same darkness that we can find an association with Halloween. Let's see how he uses magic in one of his Halloween operas. Opera is a wonderful vehicle for expressing all aspects of the human condition. Mozart's operas Don Giovanni and The Magic Flute both exploit Halloween-related concepts of fate and the supernatural. We are including The Magic Flute here because it is a personal favorite, although there is no question that Don Giovanni is a masterwork that fits our Halloween model very well. The Magic Flute is an opera in two acts to a German libretto by Emanuel Schickenator, who performed as Papageno. The work is in the form of a Zingspiel, a popular form during the time it was written that included both singing and spoken dialogue. The work was premiered in 1791 at Schickenator's Theater, the Freihaus Theater 
of Der Wieden in Vienna, just two months before Mozart's death, age just 35. Mozart wrote the magic flute for the commons, because for this segment of the populace, the more unusual the subject matter, the better. Schickenator had found that tall tales told in extravagant and exotic settings added up to a good box office take. It is interesting to note that the supernatural was already considered entertainment by 1791, the year of the opera's premiere. What is astonishing is Mozart's reaching across multiple cultures and beliefs to create a fairy tale where magic's role is simply as a tool rather than as evidence of evil. We have magical creatures and objects, a flute and bells, heroes, Tamino and Papagino, and villains of epic proportions, like the Queen of the Night, betrayal and forgiveness. In short, a whooping good tale for Halloween rife with cultural references to engage everyone. The overture's highly recognizable signature three-chord opening is a motif that repeats throughout the opera. The number three itself is repeated many times, such as the appearance of three child spirits to inspire the heroes, three ladies, Three trials, even three virtues, patience, wisdom, and persistence, etc., etc. The rest of the overture is a merry fugue, what we call counterpoint, and mastered in the Baroque by Johann Sebastian Bach, in which a sparkling little tune romps through the instruments in this greatest of Mozart's overtures.
The march of the priests at the beginning of Act 2 evokes Halloween through its suggestion that the madcap twists and turns of Act 1 have been left behind. The opera itself is comedic, heroic, and filled with magic and monsters, all ingredients that make children sit up and take note. The plot involves the killing of a giant serpent, or dragon, a quest to rescue a princess from a supposedly evil wizard, magical devices, a flute and bells that aid different characters in their trials, children who fly, and initiation into a priestly society and triumph of reason and order over chaos. Magic itself works on behalf of both heroes and villains, with the heroes prevailing because their cause is righteous. In this dark fairy tale opera, Mozart combined Egyptian mythology with Masonic symbology to create a battle between good and evil, redemption and romance, sufficient to entertain all segments of society. The Queen of the Night played by Mozart's sister-in-law, Josefa Hoffer, persuades Prince Tamino to rescue her daughter, Pamina, from captivity under the high priest, Sarastro. Instead, he learns the high ideals of Sarastro's brotherhood and seeks to join it. Separately, then together, Tamino and Pamina undergo severe trials of initiation. Silence. Fire. And water. Which end in triumph. With the queen and her cohorts, plus the treacherous 
Manostatos vanquished. But Mozart doesn't just rest on heroism to communicate his story. The earthy Papageno, with his pan flute and bells, who accompanies Tamino on his quest, fails the trials completely, but is rewarded anyway with the hand of his ideal female companion, Papagena. The treatment of Papageno is filled with humor and tolerance, and perhaps reflects the Enlightenment's lesson to observe the world objectively and without prejudice. The Age of Elegance opened the door to further exploration of magic with Romanticism. It seems strange that the Romantic era should be filled with an obsession with death, destiny, high drama, and all things gothic. However, Romantic ideas arose from an earlier German counter-enlightenment movement called Sturm und Drang, which means storm and stress. This movement directly criticized the Enlightenment's position that humanity can fully comprehend the world through rationality alone. Published in 1774 and turned into an opera by French composer Jules Massenet in 1892, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther began to shape the Romantic movement and its ideals. Romanticism was characterized by its emphasis on emotion and individualism as well as the glorification of the past and nature, preferring the medieval over the classical. Romanticism was also partly a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, the age of steam and steel. Visually, Romanticism showed itself in landscape painting, emphasizing wilderness and storms, and Gothic architecture. Caspar David Friedrich and Josef Mallard William Turner were born less than a year apart in 1774 and 1775, respectively, and were to take German and English landscape painting to their extremes of Romanticism. In 1810, E.T.A. Hoffman, named Franz Josef Haydn, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and Ludwig van Beethoven, <laughs> a 
as the three masters of instrumental compositions who breathe one and the same romantic spirit. He justified his view on these composers' depth of evocative expression and their marked individuality, but they would be followed by a plethora of composers using romantic ideas as metaphors for their own internal strife, along with the apparent chaos going on around them. Examples abound, such as Hector Berlioz, with his Faust-inspired Symphony Fantastique of 1830, Bel Canto master Gaetano Donizetti, with his Lucia di Lammermoor, of 1838, with its mad scene, based on Walter Scott's novel of 1813, Giuseppe Verdi with his 1847 opera adaptation of William Shakespeare's Macbeth, and the German colossus that was Richard Wagner with The Flying Dutchman of 1843, and at Bayreuth, his 1876 four-part Norse Edda, The Ring of the Nibelung, with its iconic Ride of the Valkyries.
Of course, not all composers would follow Wagner's model, but his use of chromaticism, refinement of the leitmotif, and focus on creating a coherent and compelling plotline, what he called Gesamtkunstwerk, total art form, would influence even his many detractors. Then there are the Russians. Particularly Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. And his many students, including one Italian in Ottorino Respighi. Slavic mythology is filled with witches like Baba Yaga and Kikimura. As depicted by Anatoliadov, and magical creatures like the Firebird. As depicted by Igor Stravinsky in his first ballet. And Russian music abounds with them as well. I have devoted an entire survey to Rimsky-Korsakov and his influence, so it won't be revisited here. So, we see a return to dark forces when it comes to magic, even when the power of light eventually triumphs. Let's look at a French composer under the shadow of Wagner. Charles-François Gounod, born in 1818 and dying in 1893, was a French composer who wrote primarily for the human voice. He wrote 12 operas, of which his most famous has always been Faust of 1859. His Shakespeare-inspired Romeo and Juliet of 1867 also remains in the international repertory. He composed a large amount of sacred works, many songs, and popular short pieces. Musically conservative, Gounod could not be called a trailblazer or the founder of any movement or school. Still, his works are tuneful, his vocal writing imaginative, and orchestral scoring masterly. Although only... A comparatively small amount of Gounod's music endures in the regular musical repertoire. His influence extended to many later French composers, including those as different from each other as Gabriel Faure of Pavan, and Jules Massenet. The first drawing on and refining Gounod's classical purity and refinement, and the latter drawing on his romantic and voluptuous side. Gounod's use of fast triplets shows up in his contribution to Halloween. In it, he provides an example of how French composers explored death as art. The magic comes in his Funeral March of a Marionette, 
a light-hearted piece of musical grotesquerie, a mock funeral procession with a jaunty beat, and a carefree tune over a humorously not slow enough funeral march rhythm. Gounod himself recognizing its popularity, set it for orchestra in 1879. The funeral march has a little program. The marionette has died in a duel, and the funeral procession enters. A contrasting central section depicts the mourners stopping off for refreshments at an inn on the funeral route. At the end, though, Gounod lets a little more Solemnity Show.
Just how it is that marionettes can act on their own is never explained. But then, magic never is. There is a bit of interesting foreshadowing in this piece, however, when we remember a later composer's use of the idea of puppets acting on their own. Igor Stravinsky in his Petrushka. The funeral march of a marionette gained international fame in the 1950s when it was selected as the sardonic theme music introducing appearances by film director Alfred Hitchcock at the beginnings and ends of his television anthology series on suspense and the grotesque. Alfred Hitchcock presents Guno's Dead Marionette is now as inseparably linked in most people's minds with the portly British filmmaker as Joaquino Rossini's William Tell Overture has been linked to The Lone Ranger. The work also appears in two episodes of the Disney Little Einsteins franchise, The Puppet Princess and The Treasure Behind the Little Red Door. Of course, Disney takes all the darkness out of their interpretation. Let's head back to opera for more Halloween magic. Giacomo Puccini, born in Lucca in 1858 and dying in Brussels in 1924, took opera into the 20th century by looking beyond Italy for his inspirations. Puccini was greatly influenced by Wagner. Particularly, his use of leitmotifs. At the same time, his early work was firmly rooted in traditional late 19th century romantic Italian opera. He later adopted the realistic Verismo style. His most renowned works are La Boheme of 1896, of 1900 <laughs> Madama Butterfly of 1904 and Turandot of 1924, completed by Franco Alfano in 1926.
all of which are among the most frequently performed and recorded of all operas. But he is still rooted in Romanticism early on, giving us our next example of Halloween music steeped in magical elements. Les Villes, or The Fairies, or Ghosts, is an opera ballet in two acts composed by Puccini in 1884 for a competition and the judges were likely to be Verdi lovers rather than supporters of change. While it did not win the competition, it attracted the notice of Verdi's publisher, Ricordi, who went on to finance Puccini's work until his death. The story, originally by Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr, was based in the central European legend of the villa and also used in the ballet Giselle by Adolphe Adam. While Le Villi was performed at Teatro San Carlo in Naples in 1888, it was not viewed favorably by either the audience or the critics, who characterized it as simply an imitation of Wagner. Puccini continued to revise the work up until 1892, when it premiered in Hamburg, conducted by Gustav Mahler, followed by performances at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, conducted by Arturo Toscanini. The work has many fine lyric moments, including a couple of tenor arias that show that from the beginning, Puccini had a superior gift for passionate melody. However, the fantastic plot, coupled with melodramatic recitations, and the inclusion of a ballet, however musically effective, makes this a curious mixture of elements that never quite gels. It does give us a taste of Puccini's interest in the storytelling power of the supernatural. The intermezzo from the opera is commonly performed under the title La Tregenda. It depicts the evil doings of ghost maidens deserted by their lovers. According to the legend of Le Villi, when a woman dies of a broken heart, fairies, disguised as beautiful women, cast a spell over the heartbreaker and force him to dance until death. Here we are caught up by Puccini's use of fast triplets, to depict this frantic and deadly dance. All along, the primary effect of fast triplets has been the driving dynamism of this rhythmic pattern.
There is something simply inescapable in this furious pace that lends itself very well indeed to Halloween themes. Of course, this is not always a fatal effect, as in our final example. The magic triplets of Paul Duca have embedded themselves in popular culture. The music of Paul Duca, like his life, straddled the Romantic and modern periods and encompassed a still wider range of influences. And he remained true to classical structures well into the 20th century. Duca wrote his two most well-known instrumental works in a short two-year burst, the Symphony in C of 1896 and The Sorcerer's Apprentice of 1897. It is the latter, of course, that we cover here, based on Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's story of the same name. It became one of the most iconic orchestral works of the late 19th century, with its rich coloration, and it was quickly taken into the repertory of conductors around the world. The Sorcerer's Apprentice takes the form of a symphonic poem, remember list, subtitled Scherzo after a ballad by Goethe. The piece was based on Goethe's 1797 poem. Its supernatural theme explicitly suits Halloween. <laughs> the Sorcerer's Apprentice is descriptively programmatic closely following the events described in Goethe's poem. The indebtedness of the stormier parts of The Sorcerer's Apprentice to The Ride of the Valkyries from The Ring has been noted by others, while the adroit use of Wagnerian leitmotifs is self-evident. Sure enough, we have the same fast triplets from The Ride of the Valkyries, underpinning the idea of magic out of control. Again, this rhythm perfectly depicts inescapable momentum. The leitmotifs are the water, the magic broom, the apprentice, and the sorcerer. Friedrich Nietzsche, whom Richard Strauss would base his Das Spake Zarathustra on, referred to Wagner as the old sorcerer. It is not too much to see in The Sorcerer's Apprentice a masterpiece demonstrating that Duca had not only learned the lessons of the master, but cunningly combined them with the French penchant for formal clarity.
its notable appearance in the Disney Fantasia franchise, both in the original from 1940 and in the sequel, Fantasia 2000, has led the piece becoming widely known to audiences outside the classical concert hall. In fact, this piece was the genesis of Fantasia, a means of introducing a reimagined Mickey Mouse to the public using music that had been part of a movement that reimagined arch music. Disney animators followed the original storyline of this symphonic poem completely, although the use of Mickey Mouse as the apprentice showcased the evolving animation of this character from its early roots. It is fascinating to look at how composers through the years have treated a topic that for centuries was essentially taboo. Of course, as society's ideas change, so too do the ways that the arts reflect those ideas. It can be argued that through music, society itself finds the inspiration to keep pushing the boundaries ever outward. Art music's approach to magic is far broader than I can cover here, but I hope I have given you a taste for it. Happy Halloween! <laughs>
So ends our magical journey. Aren't you glad you did not get changed into any creepy monster or something? But I do hope you enjoyed this magical survey for Halloween. Remember to comment, subscribe, and keep listening. I am your host, Tristan Andrew, signing off.